Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. Tonight's show is all about culture and building effective school teams. So we're going to cover all things um, to, to do with that topic. We're going to start off with looking at what school culture is, because it's something that that uh, it's a phrase that's used a lot in, in the education sphere, but one that often doesn't have... Um, sort of widespread agreement really on uh, on what we actually mean by the use of the word it means different things to different people so we're going to start off by defining that term and then we're going to going to really get into it um, into the detail of what that looks like um, and what that has looked like as a journey um, for our for our guest tonight Jay so without any further ado I'm going to bring Jay into the conversation good evening Jay hello Adam thanks for inviting me on He's there. Good. It's always like one of those things where I'm never really sure if anyone's going to say anything back to me when I uh, when I when I sort of bring you in. So that's a, that's a bit of a relief. Um, how are you? I'm very well, thank you very much. Very well indeed. Good, good. So for uh, for context, Jay is a head teacher of a, of a school just down the road from me, and uh, I think I've mentioned on previous shows that I had a, a little spell as uh, as acting head at my school not uh, not long ago, sort of about a year year and a bit ago now. And Jay was a massive massive support of uh, t- to me in that time. You uh, you really helped me through it, mate. And uh, I'm not sure we'd have I'd have got through it without you. Oh, thank you very much. It's nice to ask you to say, mate. Um, for everybody else that's sitting, do you just want to give us a bit of a background on you and tell us what's your story? Yeah, um, so I started teaching um, initially in um, a place called Rittensworth in Hertfordshire, which is just outside Watford, um, for a few years. And then I went and worked um, for a few schools in inner city London um, to get the taste and experience, really. And then I managed to get um, uh, a job for a school which had just gone, so it was just, um, I'd failed their Ofsted and the staff had left. And uh, they employed a superhead, and she um, had the enviable task of trying to rebuild this school, really. So uh, I was taken on part of that project, um, which was great. I did that for a couple of years, and then uh, I managed to um, secure a position in a school in, in Bexley. Um, and I've been there for the last 16 years, um, seven of those as deputy head, and the last three as head. Wow, so that's quite the journey then. But being in one school for for sixteen years is uh, that that's quite something. You must have seen a lot of a lot of change come and go in that time. Absolutely, and you know, it's been yeah, it's been a journey. It's been a very it's a very different context than it was when I first started. Yeah. Seen many people come in and leave, and um, I think especially in terms of talking about today, talking about climate, and talking about culture, and talking about teams. We're, uh, it's been a real journey for us, um, and yeah, especially for me um, as a head. That is really interesting to hear you talk about that word journey there as well, because often culture, we, we sometimes we sort of think about culture as something that's static and something that doesn't kind of move, but it, it really changes and shifts quite a lot, doesn't it, over the course of a school's journey. And often like the culture that you're aiming for is almost like a, a destination of that journey, but it's a temporary destination because as soon as you get there, it's, it's shifting again. But, but the journey and getting there is, is, is as, as, as much a part of, uh, is as much as, as an important part of where you actually get to in the end, isn't it? Yeah, completely. And, you know, it's, it, as you say, I think you're right there. It's really flexible. It's continuously changing. Um, and it's, it, it's very much a, um, a case of uh, a joint um, goal, joint end in terms of the um, where culture is, culture sits, and not sitting directly at the top, as it were. Um, and for me, especially, defining that culture and where we we'll, where we want to go um, is very much been a journey, not just for myself, but every member of my school. Mm. And like, what absolutely fascinates me about your place is is how you you when when you when you come in and you and you walk around, like the culture of the place does feel like it is coming from the inside out. Like it it really doesn't feel like it's like it's top down, and it doesn't in in many ways as well. And I, th- and I mean this as a, as an absolute compliment. It doesn't actually feel like it's coming like just from you. 
and often you go to schools and you can you can kind of think oh yeah the culture of this place i can really see i can really see that that's come from the head and i can see that in in your school i can see that it's come from you but it really feels like it it kind of emanates out of everybody and everything in the school rather than just from that one person i'm going to try and get into that in a little bit more detail with uh, with jay in a moment and find out exactly how he's how he's gone about doing that but we're going to first of all just go to our our first word from our friends and sponsors hi teachers we're apps for good and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses our courses are for everyone including those who aren't computing teachers and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the uk computing curriculum independent learning is central to our courses your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24-7. Now you can with the teaching how-tos platform. This highly personalised social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques, either independently, working collaboratively with their peers, or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques, designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the How To app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Watch sessions by thought leaders in education, literacy experts, and ed tech specialists from the International Reading Conference for free. The lineup included renowned speakers such as TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui and beloved children's author Michael Rosen. The three-day conference explored a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Sign up to receive the recordings for free by visiting the Reading Solutions UK website at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Okay, welcome back. So, Jay, let's uh, let's just come back a little bit before we then dive straight into um, to, to, to your school and your context. Then, for the purposes of this conversation, what are we defining as school culture? Like, what do we mean by that? Okay, so I suppose I suppose from my perspective, I think it's uh, those shared values and and beliefs that people within the school community have. I mean, it's it's that belief system that's in the fabric of the school, in my opinion. I think they uh, it very much relies on a, a set of cultural norms, um, but most importantly, I think it needs to be valued and shared um, by everybody. Mm. Um, I suppose for me, school culture is something that all the stakeholders need to buy into, and this is the bit that we talked about and we referred to earlier on in terms of making sure that everyone within the school staff as well as you know your, your governors and your children and your parents etc all buy into it and also feel ownership of i think i suppose yeah. ultimately the aim of it is just to maintain high quality teaching and learning and um, and have that long-term positive effect on children's life chances I suppose. yeah definitely and i think that's like where where you've made a really strong link there is between like your ethos and and what the culture of this what you want the culture of your school to be as well because I think 
your ethos to me anyway is almost like your reason for being there like your reason for teaching your reason for, for running a school and doing what you do and you've you know you're really clear on that that you want to improve kids life chances and then the culture kind of would would, would come from that I guess and I'm, I'm interested though about how how you've managed to get to that point where the culture doesn't come solely from you but it actually feels like it's coming from everybody else so like for example when I come to your school and like I talk to the receptionist, she, it, it feels like she has exactly the same understanding of what that school should feel like as you do. And she's contributing to how that school feels in exactly the same way as what you are and as powerfully. And then equally, like, and I'll give you an example of this. So you're super open. Like you, uh, again, when, and I'll, I'll bring you back to that example I gave earlier, when, when I was acting head at my school, you were the first one on the phone to be like, right, let me know if you need anything. Come down here. I'll come over there. You know, let's, let, let's, you know, get involved and, and have a chat about stuff. So you were super open. And when I, when I last came to your school, we were talking about instructional coaching. I said, oh, no, do you think there'd be anyone that, that, that wouldn't mind us popping into a lesson? And then Im- immediately there was a teacher who, who you said, oh, you know, is it okay if we come in? And, and that teacher was so, so open and so willing to have someone that they had no idea who they were in their lesson. And they were more than happy to talk about it beforehand and talk about it afterwards. And so like that, that openness not only is in, is, comes from you, but it's also coming obviously from your teachers, but also from your receptionists as well. Like how, how have you got to that point where it just bleeds out of everybody? And, that, and that's it's really interesting, actually, because when you're talking about um, culture, one of the things that I really want to talk about is is openness. Now, I think there's a few things to kind of unpack here in terms of the fact that when I first started, uh, and I took over the headship role of my school, I had all staff, and I mean all staff, um, together. And I said, right, the key here, the only way we're going to move in the direction that we want to move in is if we we're open and talk to each other. So if there is an issue, if there's a problem at all, I don't want to see clandestine meetings in rooms. I don't want to see groups of TAs or you know, groups of people in the office, for example, having a conversation that they're not happy about something. Um, many a time, you know, I, I, can't, I can't change anything or improve anything as a head teacher or as an, I'm an SLT if I don't know about it. So... I've always said straight away, we're having an open door policy. My door is always open. So at any point, anybody, without fear of reprisals, and I think that's really important, can come into me and talk openly about something which is um, interesting to, you know, of interest to them. So it might be a well-being issue. It might be something which is a work-life balance issue. And I'll openly listen to it and talk about it and communicate with it. Um, and they know that it's something which I'll take seriously. I think that's really important for a start, but I think um, just the idea of having that kind of openness and also, again, coming that direction, I don't make decisions. It's not a case of being done to. It's a case of that collective action. And I think that, again, that term is going to come back a few times in our conversation. Collective but action. Mm. That collective action whereby we're not, they're not being done to. We're going through together. Um, and everyone gets an opportunity to be able to be part of that process is important. Do you know what I love about the idea of, of, of collective action is that I always think that when um, I talk about this a lot here, actually, this idea of accountability and accountability in schools has ended up being like twisted completely out of out of its original usage, I think, because when it was accountability in its purest form is I think is a relationship and it's about you and me and everybody else that's got a vested interest in a particular goal all getting around the table and going right I can contribute this you can contribute that this person can contribute this and all of us sort of pulling in what we can contribute and then being accountable to each other for the actions that we can all take towards that collective aim and it's sort of been twisted into this thing whereby it's the person directly above you telling you what to do and then making sure that you've done it and I just think that account if accountability gets framed as a as a collective relationship more than like a high more than like a function of hierarchy, which is I think what it's become, I think what you end up with there is what you're terming as um collective action. So yeah, I, I, I yeah. love that idea. Yeah, and I, I, it comes down, doesn't it, ultimately to that kind of eradicating that them and us philosophy. Now we've all worked yeah. uh, in a schools whereby there is a 
distinct difference between the senior leaders and the rest of the staff. And there is some, that there been us culture. And I think right from the very beginning, if you're going to try, you need to try and get rid of that and say, actually, why are we all here? Why have we gone into this school? Whether that be in the office, whether that be as a, you know, um, as a caretaker, whether that be a cleaner, whether it be a TA or a, you know, a uh, teacher. Ultimately, we've chosen to go and work in education. We've chosen to work in a school. And we're all there uh, ultimately to support children and education. Therefore, um, there should be them and us. It should be a closed door policy or that, again, being done to. So if you feel valued, a valued member of the school, um, whatever level you are, that straight away challenges that, that them and us philosophy. Yeah, definitely. I, I, just, I just really like that idea of like how you've managed to get everybody understanding that you're all part of the same of the same collective ambition and the same collective aim. And then it, it but then actually living that out is really important as well, because I think I think the first bit of saying, you know, we're all in this together and what's our collective purpose and we all want the same thing. I think a lot of people do that. But I think that far less actually maintain that commitment to collective action and everybody being accountable for for each particular aim so like you know I, I really like the idea of of having um of like when you do your sdp about like having input from everybody but not just input around what should the targets be or what should we be aiming for but having input from people around right what what weight have i got to offer to this particular target that we've got and always making sure that there is some weight or some action that's being offered by someone fairly senior so that senior person is accountable to everybody else within within that team of people working on a particular aim at any at any given time. So it's not just the, se- the senior person's role isn't there isn't just to monitor it and oversee it and and make sure that everyone's doing what they're supposed to be doing. It's also to contribute something to to the overall aim as well. I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think that idea of everyone feeling they've got value and the fact that their input is valued. And so therefore, yeah, the, the role of senior leadership is not to sit there and monitor and criticise. It's to be able to be supportive and be able to add extra value to it so that yeah, everyone feels part of the aim. I don't think that comes overnight. You know, I think that takes a long time. And I'm not saying for us it did because, you know, it's, it's talking about the SIP um, and the development of the SIP for years. It was very, very much sort of, um, head and deputy head led. Uh, over the years, we've developed that to get more and more input from um, teachers and staff. I think that um, it's become such a powerful school improvement tool now because of the fact that yeah, there's so many people from all different, like, so many different skills um, to be able to contribute to it. Um- there's a, there's a few sound issues there, Jay. I don't know if there's uh, if you want to just check your your connection there, or um, I'm not sure. It might be something just to, sounds just a little bit askew. But just while Jay checks that, I'll just summarise what um, what he was saying there as well because it's, it's fantastic points around the use of the SDP as as a tool to really genuinely drive school improvement. And Jay was saying that like in in his school, the role of senior leaders is not purely just to monitor and make sure that everything is happening that's supposed to be happening, but it's actually to to kind of guide improvement and lead lead the improvement of the school. And that by using the the school development plan as a as a document where, as I was saying, where everybody can can document their the, the weight that they've got to offer to particular goals and aims that the, that, the, that the school are working on. It brings everybody together under that collective action again, because you've got those collective aims and everybody's got a role to contribute within those. Um, and I know that Jay uses, uses his SDP to, um, as, as a kind of a working document that has that, that has that aim that everybody can refer back to it. And no matter what your role is, you've got something to contribute to, to all of our, all of our school aims. Um, it's interesting. I was, I was, I'm doing my MPQH at the moment, and I was on one of the one of the face to face days recently. And of course, it's it's a course that's being delivered from um, with with the idea being that you know you're talking to potential head teachers of the future, and so it is about the role of the head teacher. So, but one of the things that was said is that you know the head teacher is the person that that sets the culture, and and I absolutely do do believe that. And one thing I want to get into a little bit with Jay when um, when, when we come back is the fact that. 
you know, the culture has to reflect the head teacher and what the head teacher uh, signals to everybody else as important, because otherwise it's it just ends up not being sustainable. But also what I think is often underappreciated is that while the head teacher will set the culture, it's not sustainable for a head teacher to be the only person that's driving that culture and maintaining it. It's got it, it's got to end up being passed down to everybody else as well at at some point. Um, and that's something that I know Jay's worked really hard on at, at his school to make sure that the culture that that he wanted and the culture that his staff all wanted together is is something that's that's believed in by by other people. Another phrase that I hear a lot on on my MPQH is this this idea of buy in. Um, and I was talking to, to to someone else recently that that actually said they said to me actually I don't want anyone to buy into anything. What I want them to do is believe in it. And and I, I really like that distinction because buy in does have that kind of transactional feel to it i suppose and i don't think that anything in educational really should ever feel solely transactional particularly anything that that concerns leadership or or school improvement it should always feel like what we're doing is something that we really truly believe in and we always we we use a lot of that language of belief um you know when we talk about ethos and and reason for being here and motivation and all that kind of stuff but then it feels like sometimes when we get down to like the nuts and bolts level of school improvement, we end up stop, we, we stop talking about belief and motivation and we start talking about buy-in and monitoring. And it's in some, somewhere on the line there, we've kind of divorced school improvement from, from like the really personal act of teaching, which is the thing that's going to improve life chances and outcomes for pupils more than anything else that, that, that goes on in a school. Um, so Jay, if we, if we sort of bring you back in there then, so to what extent, does um so what to what extent does this culture that you've got at the school to what extent does that represent you and reflect you as an individual all right did you hear me better now loud clear and frankly lovely oh perfect Uh, um yeah to an extent um i think that there's a cumulative effect um my own beliefs and my own values and um the way I feel that a strong school culture should look. Um, but I also think it's, it's past experiences in my career has massive impact and negative influences and practices, which I've seen along the way, which I think, oh, no, I wouldn't want to do that. Or that's not what I, you know, how I would, um, what I think is, uh, you know, the epitome of a strong culture. Um, and I've seen, and I, I suppose, you know, if I look, or to expand on that, I suppose, it's that kind of thing for when in my career I've seen teachers really guilty, for example, about being ill, being off ill, or mm. going home at a reasonable time. And, you know, that kind of, that sort of shaking of heads as they're, they're leaving the building at six o'clock and it's too early or <laughs> not going to get, you know, not telling them they're not going to get paid to a going to the child, a child's activity or seeing the leaders openly berating staff in corridors, all this kind of stuff I've seen and thought, actually, I've learned from that experience and I know that what, how that makes me feel and I, I, I know that how that makes other people feel and that's something when I'll have my own school that I'm going to make sure that um, I'm going to eradicate. And I think as well, learning from my mistakes, you know, Again, I'll come back to that collective action. But when I first started, I'm only my finished just finishing my third year um, of headship. But ultimately, I was very much when I first started talking about right. This is what we're doing. Right, I had a very clear idea, really motivated, really interested in driving the school forwards. And um, ultimately, I'm going into meetings with staff and I'm telling them what I want. And I realised by doing that, you just you've got no buy-in, you've got no motivation from staff. Mm-hmm. So I very much quickly learned that actually, although I've got my idea of how I want the school culture to be and how I want the school to run, getting that buy-in, getting that engagement, getting that motivation, using ideas from the staff we have, and then collectively driving, um, is really really important. I so. Think Sorry, yeah, I, I was just, I mean, that bit that you just said there, again, you, you're back to it where you, you've basically allowed everybody to co construct this culture. It is not just something that is the sole construction of the head teacher. And I think that's so interesting. 
I do, and I don't, no, uh, I'm the same as you. I've, I've done my MP, uh, MPQ, uh, H and I'm doing my MPQ EL. And I, you, you get the, the, the information through that very much is, is led by the head. And you're right, there is an element of that. And I mean, there needs to be, of course. And, but it, it's not about that. And I think if you, if it's just driven by that, then, um, you can have a school culture which is quite toxic. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I just think it, 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 that that's a different way of seeing it. I think than than what a lot of people see. It a lot of people do see the head's role as the person to to set the culture, and I suppose the head's role is definitely to kind of look. look you, you're not going to have a school culture that doesn't align with the head's culture, right? But absolutely. If, so the head's got to be the person to start it off. But ultimately, if it's gonna if it's gonna snowball and it's gonna ha- start to have a really big positive effect over the long term, everybody, as you say, has got to, has got to believe in it or buy into it, and and so giving everybody a, an input into it is huge, right? Yeah, and do you not think that ultimately that comes down in, in part to recruitment? Oh well, that's huge i mean and I, I was you know that was one of the the next things i wanted to ask you really was was uh was about recruitment before before we do that one i want to like, just put a word to you and just see see what your your response to it is in the context of of culture like the words authenticity why is what what is that around around culture is it important what does it mean to you how do you react to that yeah massive i think it's a crucial role authenticity You're, especially in order to build trust and credibility i mean when school leaders act in a way that is genuine and transparent, they're going to build that credibility. I mean, in terms of engagement, people feel they're, they're dealt with honestly, they feel so they're dealt with respectfully, then they're likely to participate actively, contribute, contribute you know, positively. Um, turn back to openness. You know, I think that when we think about openness and communication, you know, an authentic school, everyone's all the staff feels they can express their true thoughts and feelings. And I suppose that openness then leads to a more inclusive environment, doesn't it? And you've got the idea of diverse perspectives then valued. Um, so, yeah, I mean, authenticity it helps everyone to value, doesn't it? Um, it's that's, it integrates that sense of belonging, and that's critical, isn't it, for a positive school climate? And for yeah. all of the staff to feel part of a community, and that's what it is. Ultimately, it's that creation of a community, creation of a family. Yeah, and you know, there, there's so many things coming through in what you're saying that that having been to your school, like I keep thinking to myself, yeah, that's that's your school actually. Community, family, openness, like these are all these are words that I would, and I've only visited your school a handful of times, but those are the words that I would I would use to describe the the culture that you've built up. But another word that I'd used probably to describe not necessarily the culture itself, but but perhaps how that culture is lived out is it's effortless. And I think that's because, to my mind, that's because it's authentic. Like when something's authentic, it is just happening naturally and it is it, it is real. It's not kind of staged or or thought out or manufactured. It is real. And that's the authenticity side of it. And I think where where you've where you've got culture that's if you have a culture that's not authentic, it feels like really hard work, and you actually can't get on with the business of improving teaching and learning because you're constantly conscious of how do we foster this culture that we've decided we want. Well, if if the culture you've decided you want to foster is authentically you, and is and is authentically the co-constructed version of what you and when I say you, I mean the school community you. If it's if it's that co-constructed version of what you want. And what you really all truly believe in, it, it will come through naturally anyway. You won't have to work hard for it. Exactly, and I think that that's the key. If, if, it's, if a culture is forced upon a team, forced upon a forced upon a school, then you're going to have trouble with that bar, and you're going to have trouble in terms of everyone effortlessly working towards that. Whereas if it's join if there is an idea that everyone feels that they're part of that process about how they feel how they want the school to look how the way they want the school to feel and then make a concerted effort in the day-to-day climate to be able to act in the way which they want the the, the, you know, the, the culture to be then as you say it's, un- it's not something that people need to work at it's effortless it's just the way we are you know you walk into my school um 
you talk to the teachers, they talk about it being a family. You talk about the, pa- the, you know, the parents, they talk about it being a family. The children talk about being a family. We recently had Ofsted, and one of the comments they made in our report was the fact that children see it as a family. And that's really important. Mm-hmm. It's the wording you use. It's, it's the wording you use again and again, again to be able to you know, structure and be part of, you know, of the day-to-day. It's just, it's, it becomes ingrained, as you say, effortless. Yeah, I love that. I love the fact that that word family just comes through so strongly, whoever you talk to. And the fact that, that those offset inspectors have, have commented on that and the kids talk about it as a family as well. That's kind of, to my mind, that's sort of job done, really. I mean, you, if you put good teachers in good classrooms and you've got good systems, you're going to get the academics right at some stage and you know that by no means by the way downplays the effort that has to go into to to leading great teaching and learning that's kind of the bread and butter of my role and i absolutely love it and i'd I'd never suggest that it's anything other than highly highly complex to get really good teaching going on but if if you can do that bit then that sort of takes care of the of the academic side of things but primary schools and all schools really but particularly primary schools i think there's a there's a big part of parents thinking when they choose where they're going to send their child which is which is governed by what's my kids lived experience going to be day in day out what's it going to feel like for them to walk into those buildings every day and if you can absolutely nail that that feeling of of family god i think that's i think that's so powerful for for, for kids and parents jay just quickly uh, before go on no go on no, no i was just going to say one thing you know uh, which is important is is understanding that idea you know as you say Expectations, high expectations, teaching and learning is fundamental. But in order for that to happen, you need to make sure that your teaching staff are happy. And the idea of teachers wanting to get up in the morning, really want to come to work. And the fact that we know that we're all human beings and we've all got lives outside school. So inevitably, all of us are going to have those external pressures and strains. But for a school be able to understand that and accommodate for those is it's going to have a huge impact in terms of well-being and that's going to therefore have a really um, positive impact on the teacher when that's understood and therefore the children and therefore teaching and learning you know, they're all inextricably linked aren't they mm, yeah without doubt without doubt they each feeds into the other you know there's no question about that um okay we're going to go to uh, we're going to go to the news when we come back um, I'm going to try and get into the uh, to the importance of recruitment around culture. So, so far, we've talked about this amazing culture that you have absolutely set at your school. We've talked about some of the mechanisms for making sure that you co-construct that culture and, and that that in itself makes it more sustainable. Talked about the importance of, of culture being authentic so that it therefore becomes effortless and something that, that just bleeds throughout your organisation. But then some people leave and other people join, and that's a threat to, to school culture as well. And you've got to make sure, therefore, that you recruit the right people. So when we come back from the news, we're going to get into exactly how Jay goes about recruiting the right people. Hi, teachers. We're Apps for Good, and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24-7. Now you can with the teaching how-tos platform. This highly personalised social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques, either independently, working collaboratively with their peers, or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the HowTo app. 
No gurus, just practical support any time you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Watch sessions by thought leaders in education, literacy experts, and ed tech specialists from the International Reading Conference for free. The lineup included renowned speakers such as TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui and beloved children's author Michael Rosen. The three-day conference explored a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Sign up to receive the recordings for free by visiting the Reading Solutions UK website at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. In higher education news, the BBC reports on the 5,000 students who have brought claims against University College London over the quality of teaching provided during the pandemic. The news website reports that the trial will move to the start of 2026 and will likely be the first, although current and former students from other universities are also seeking compensation. The lead claimant against UCL began his campaign for compensation while still a student, studying for a master's between 2020 and 2021. He told the BBC he paid £14,000 for his international politics degree, which ended up being solely online. He is suing UCL because he says he did not get what he paid for. Test cases will be identified in November, although lawyers representing the students said they would welcome sensible settlement proposals from UCL so that this matter does not proceed to trial. A spokesperson for UCL said the university had prioritised health and safety of the community and followed UK government guidance throughout the pandemic. The standard covers Eaton's plans to ban smartphones for the next academic year. From September, the school will issue boys with a phone that can only be used to make calls and send texts. Eaton follows several other private schools who have made similar decisions and are urging parents to only buy smartphones if absolutely necessary. The Eaton rules apply to pupils who are aged 13 and in their first year at the school. A letter sent to parents of new boarders said that any smartphone should be taken home after its SIM card was transferred to the school-issued simple handset. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Sir Keir Starmer says he's not in favour of simply banning phones for under-16s. In May, a committee of MPs said the new government should consider a ban within its first year because of what it called serious dangers posed to children. The PM said there was a serious question to be asked about what content children can access and how it could be controlled, but that a ban wasn't a practical way forward. Sakia was speaking on ITV's Good Morning Britain and said he would sit down with anyone to look at how to put better protections in place. He avoided questions about his own children's use of smartphones, saying he wanted to keep them out of political discussions of any kind. BBC News reports on a review commissioned by Reading Borough Council following the death of head teacher Ruth Perry. The review criticised a culture of high stakes accountability that led to the public condemnation of individuals. The review included conversations with Mrs Perry's colleagues and governors at the primary school she led, as well as the head teachers and council officers in the local area. There were also meetings with the family of Mrs Perry. The review concluded that what happened to Mrs Perry showed the folly of the macho culture of high stakes accountability. 
It also recommends the local authority support calls for Ofsted to scrap its one-word judgments. Mrs Perry's sister, Professor Julie Waters, said she welcomed the call for the council to join the campaign, but said the review goes very lightly on the local authority. Ofsted will publish a review later this summer. Finally, Ireland's RTE focuses on Queen's University Belfast's recognition of the support role pets play in educational attainment. 25 animals took part in a special graduation ceremony following the main summer graduations. Queen said the gesture is based on research that shows the important degree of support animals can provide as study buddies. Dogs, cats and a hamster took to the red carpet for the informal ceremony with plenty of puns in the awards, which included a doctorate and a catificate. The university said research has shown that time spent with pets can improve concentration levels and lower stress, two things that are important when studying. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. So for anybody out there that wants to convince their head teacher to get a, a school dog or a school cat, school anything, um, there there you have it. There's the evidence for you. It improves concentration. So, um, yeah, put that to your head teacher on uh, on Monday morning next week and see, uh, see how far you get with that one. Right. So, uh, Jay, welcome back. We're going to get into the issue of recruitment now. So let's start with then, in your view, what role does culture play in, in the recruitment process? Yeah, I think it plays you know, a significant role. As she said, it's making sure that you've got having those people, um, those staff members um, on your team, the whole work that buying and motivation engagement is crucial. So for me, it, it's about clarity. So I make it very clear during any walk arounds um, and the substance discussion I have with any potential. Uh, teacher or TA, as I say, it's not even just um, the teaching staff or support staff, it's anybody who, who needs to join our um, organisation. We have a very clear, open discussion about what our school is and the culture within our school. We, and then moving on to that, and so, so before anyone applies for us, as you say, coming in the door, within five seconds, you, you can understand what our culture is. Um, and that is very much um, a prime discussion. Um, and then in, the, in, in terms of the application process and the interview process, uh, we're really aware of that when we are looking through to see those kind of personalities um, of the people who are applying. And ultimately, we try and employ um, individuals who have similar values and beliefs. Um, ultimately, we don't. We don't employ to a year group, so we don't sit there. I don't. I never say, right, okay, we've got a space in year three, and so I'm going to employ a teacher for year three. It doesn't work like that. I employ the person. We employ the person. Um, and irrespective of what that looks like necessarily on paper, many a time I've looked at candidates on paper, and when you get them in for a uh, conversation, discussion, interview, uh, actually they become more of a fit than people would do necessarily on paper. So I think it really is about having that conversation, having that discussion, and, and really exploring their particular views and values about why they're in education and what their um, they believe that an organisation would be and how it fits to them, and making sure there's a match on both sides. Okay, and sometimes we go through the processes and... Um, the, the candidate themselves was actually, I don't think this is a particular fit in your organisation. And that's absolutely fine because it's making sure you get the right person for us, but also obviously the right person, uh, the right school for them. Yeah, and I think that's that that's really important. And I know that um, Catherine Burblesing, who's the, the, the head of um, Michaela Free School, she talks about this a lot and the fact that she's got a really unapologetic commitment to a particular way of running her school and a particular culture that, that she wants to create within within her school and, and her staff all buy into that or believe in it, whichever whichever way. I've not visited myself to be able to say, but but they either buy in or they believe in it or both. Um, 
and she is she is really clear on the culture that that she wants but she's also really clear that actually you don't have to send your kid here so if you don't if you don't agree with the culture that we've created then then don't send your child here if you don't agree with the culture that we've created you don't have to come and work here um and she's kind of absolutely fine with that and so i think that there's i think this culture debate and this i think sometimes it can get down to like the really binary nature of right and wrong good and bad and I don't think that really exists. I think as long as as long as everyone's open, comes back to that word that you keep using, as long as everyone's open with, right, this is what we stand for, this is what we believe in, this is what it's like here, I don't think anyone can ever kind of be wrong by that. As long as you're open oh, about I, it, everyone knows what they're, what they're joining, right? I completely agree. And, and again, there are going to be situations we've had it in the past where people come around and it's just not, it's not going to be the right fit for them. And, you know, we... Some people want to be led, very clearly led. Some people, you know, we very much um, like our staff, our teachers especially, to be really creative, be thinking outside the box. We try and give as much autonomy as we can to them to be able to make decisions based on their own classrooms. And that really appeals to some teachers and actually really doesn't to others. And that's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you say, it comes back to that openness and saying, well, this is what we are. This is what we believe in. This is what this is the direction and the vision that we're going on. Um, and if you feel that you could be part of that, if you feel that you can contribute to that and you'd enjoy that journey, then come and join us. You know, if not, that's absolutely fine. You know. Mm, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, okay, let's let's take it off piece a little bit then. Let's go in. Let's think about. So you've got this culture, and you understand, you know, the importance of recruiting people that fit with that culture. So you've got people with similar values, all within the same building, all within the same organisation, right? But how do you go from that to establishing a team, or is that is that what a team is? Well, I mean, there are two things about this. I think if you're looking at what a team is um so yeah there is that shared goal there's that shared outcome there's that vision um i think with a team and i think it's that it, interdependence is is the key to this one so mm-hmm. ultimately there's a, there's a group of people and they're all working independently to be able to achieve that shared goal aren't they, or that outcome mm. yeah, and in schools that goal ultimately relates to lifelong learning positive life chances for children mm. but i love that that idea that that interdependence because i think maybe that is the thing that okay you, you could embed that within within a school culture as well i suppose but that is perhaps something that that even if you had a culture that didn't explicitly value interdependence if you want a team you've got to have interdependence people have got to be dependent on each other and they've people have got to kind of be comfortable with that and I suppose that you know, the example that I think of with that is think about curriculum design um, yeah. and and how, you know, we, we all want to make sure that we've got, you know, really, really clear concepts that are continually repeated and deepened as children move up from from reception or nursery uh, right the way through to, to, to year six in, in primary. Um, and so to achieve that, we've got to make sure that if I'm the year three teacher, I've got to absolutely make sure that I've nailed the stuff that I needed to teach to those year threes. Because when I pass them up to you as the year four teacher, you're going to need that knowledge to be in place for you to, so that you can actually build on that strategically. Because that's how the curriculum has been built and designed. But the enacted curriculum relies on you and I understanding that we've got that interdependence whereby you rely on me to do my bit so that so that your bit's doable and doesn't feel like other, otherwise you end up with year six teachers doing that whole cavalry charge thing with with reading writing and maths which is which is which is never healthy or good for anybody um you know so what, yeah, I'm, what I'm, yeah i agree i, I just I was going to say that it's really interesting your point there and um what's interesting there is that especially in my school that idea of um, progression in the curriculum and say early years being their own team and they work independently within early years actually that doesn't help when it comes up to year three four where we're talking about progression in learning we're talking about building on prior knowledge so we very much say right actually you are it's bigger than that you're working into in- independently but you need to have a very good understanding of early years otherwise mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to you need to know where you come from and where you're going to. So rather than working in teams of just lower key stage two and working well, but un- have a you know a, a, an understanding, cursory understanding of what's come before, 
Um, I think that the only way it will work effectively is having a working as teams, larger teams, working independently together to be able to have a real deep understanding about prior learning and, and future learning and making sure they see their part within that, within that cog, as it were, that wheel. Yeah, totally. And that's and that's really interesting, isn't it? This idea of like, okay, so you've your school certain schools will be of a size whereby you need to be able to to have people um you need to have to be able to have people working in their sort of smaller teams but everything's got to feed back into that um to, to that much much larger team and the uh, and the overall aims of the whole school and jay often we we talk about um certainly over here i'm not sure if it's if it's the same anywhere else but quite often we kind of hear um we hear sort of comparisons between teams within different organizations and different kind of contexts so often one that's used over here is this comparison between like sports teams and schools within within school uh, and teams sorry within school contexts and I remember certainly as in my earlier career I remember distinctly having a conversation with one uh, particular head teacher about leadership and they were like, you know, yeah, you just got to be, you just got to be really Sir Alex Ferguson about it. I think, I don't think he was, a, oh no, he was, he would have been a Sir at that point. Yeah. You just got to be more Sir Alex Ferguson about it. You know, you know, what, what, yeah. what does that mean? He's like, well, yeah, you know, you just got to demand, you just got to demand better and better standards every day. Right. Well, yeah, but, but fundamentally you haven't got the, um, you haven't quite got the same financial incentives to just demand better standards from people in teaching as you, as you do in professional football. And I, I don't know, I've just never felt that, that it's, that it's always been a, a, a comparison that's been made helpfully. What, what's your, what's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, you know, there is, there isn't necessarily, there are obviously differences. I think there are similarities. You know, take away the competitive element, which you we always have that kind of comparison. I know you're saying teams, and you know we don't have that uh, competitiveness in the you know, when you compare it. But I think there are um, some similarities, um, some fundamental commonalities or characteristics. I mean, um, within a team, within a school. You, you know, there is a common goal, there is a common vision, obviously, which is comparative that kind of sports arena as well. Um, you know, there's that necessity for strong shared leadership, isn't there? Um, mm-hmm. And there's that need for a effective communication, which you come back down to again. You know, you have a look at any sports team or you're looking at you know, a, a team within school, there needs to be that effective communication for that to work properly, you know. And again, if you're going to be, if you're going to have that comparison, comparison to to sports teams, it's that it's those complementary skills, isn't it, in expertise, which which uh, are important there. Um, I think that ultimately there's that, that efficiency, motivation, and morale you have as a team, uh, which works both in the sports kind of arena and within teams within a, an educational sector. And um, ultimately, so I think that yeah, there are certain commonalities. I suppose, yeah. If, if the commonalities are perhaps on a on a more sort of um, maybe like a less tangible level, perhaps, um, mm. and perhaps you think when you're thinking about things like culture and behaviours and beliefs and like and things like ethos and collective direction, the things that are harder to kind of you know get hold of and touch within a school. Like perhaps yeah, that that is where there's there's perhaps more commonality with with sports teams. Perhaps it's more kind of the 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 day to day actions that are taken as a as a sports team that maybe maybe there's less commonality with the actions that would be taken as a as part of a team in in, in other contexts. And particularly as I guess as the leader of that team. Um, yeah. Yeah. Perhaps there's you know I think the way that. The way that certain uh, another as another comparison, like I used to, um, I used to be a, a tennis coach before I was a before I was a teacher, and um, I used to coach a guy who was the managing director of Goldman Sachs, and I was I used to coach him a little bit in, in my early part of my teaching career as well, and he used to just say his answer to everything was just, you just get rid of them, you just sack them. It's like, well, it's, it's not always, you know, it's not always that. I don't think it's that easy, you know. And um, yeah, don't get me wrong. There are absolutely times when, when, when that's doable and, and and the right thing to do, I guess, within within education. But but ultimately, I think that education as a 
as a sector is about, for obvious reasons, is about developing people. And I think that in education, we are rightly more patient with the development of people. Perhaps we need to be because we haven't got the financial incentives, like I say, to kind of demand better and better um, just just by the fact, by, by the nature of the fact that we just want it. Whereas in other, perhaps in other industries, you, you, you do have that. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I just think that that idea of that idea of team and leadership is not a generic one. And I think sometimes when it's it, it can be used publicly as a, as a really generic term and it's it's so context specific like leadership is so context specific T- this idea of teams is so context specific that it's not like there's this generic set of qualities that 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 makes a great leader and that leader will be brilliant in whatever context D- is that making is that making any sense no i agree with you completely as i say i think well especially if you're talking about leadership in different contexts yeah and i think that it's interesting you're talking about the private sector there and that kind of um cutthroat mentality and i'm really glad that we don't have that we, we can't afford to have that um in the education sector because mm. if we go back to that culture you know developing a culture whereby every time you think it's actually not working the way you want it to and then you just think right that's it i'm just going to cut them around if you go mm. you know, the, that mm. lack of stability that lack of safety um you're never going to get to where you want um and the ins and outs of recruitment in terms of people in and out, you're never going to be able to have that stability in order to create what you're looking for, that vision. So I think that having that, that in, you know, in, that, in that sense, having a, in education environment, in the school environment, we, can't, we don't have that, makes us um, really work at what we've got and make the best of what we've got and actually you know, have uh, give people time to be able to, to engage and to be able to you know, motivate towards what we want. And I think you're absolutely right. And without without that psychological safety that comes from the security, you're not going to get that lasting that lasting culture that you want anyway. Um, and you're certainly not going to get any sort of commitment to development and 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 things like trial and error and 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 people sort of trying things and seeing how they go and working with a coach and all of those things that we all think increasingly are really good things to do. It's much harder to get that if you've got if you're in an environment of of judgment rather than rather than one of development. Um, what what do you do then if someone really doesn't fit into the team? Because as we say, we can't just say to people, and it's a good thing that we think that we can't just say to people, right, you're out. So what do you do if someone doesn't fit with the team? And that's a really interesting one. Um, and there are always going to be situations, I think, whereby you know, certain individuals won't fit into the team. So I think I, I'm going to come back again to that kind of openness and communication. I think this is critical, it's crucial within this um, discussion. So I think the idea that there is someone who's fit into that team is identifying, initially identifying those issues as to why and having that. Um, dialogical um, back and forth and working out through communication as to where where, the, where it doesn't fit I think um, so that open communication and then for, and that provision of constructive feedback I think is really important um, and then I suppose you're, you're going to move you move on to that support and the support network training development perhaps or mentorship um, but again I think you, Along these lines, you need to make sure those expectations are clear. I don't think you can compromise on what you want from the team. Yeah, you can be flexible. I think you can um, look at individual contexts, but I think ultimately you've got to stick to what is true. Um, but yeah, as long as those expectations and high expectations are clear, I think ultimately you then end up monitoring the progress. Uh, and then I think you end, up, you end up making a decision, and hopefully that decision is a mutually, um, you know, it's a mutual decision, and that you can move forward. And if not, you need to look at transition into another team or perhaps a different role, which is more fitting for that particular individual. It's very tricky, but these situations are always going to happen, aren't they? Inevitably. Yeah. Do you know the the the, the thing that I've I've been thinking about a fair bit lately and it was it was off the back of um i did a a day at a a university um probably sort of three or four weeks ago and 
and one of the uh, one of the other people who was who was speaking that that day did a did a session on the difference between transition and change, and it's really got me thinking about that. And it just came back to me then as you were speaking. And often it is about making a transition is is about is about a mindset shift, and there's an emotional process that's related to making a transition from from one from one yeah. thing or to another and perhaps that's the way to think about it when someone does isn't fitting into to a particular team it, it is about making a transition perhaps isn't it and it's about trying to get that person or potentially looking at it the other way around the existing team and going right well someone here has got to make some kind of emotional invested shift towards a different way of thinking and a different way of of seeing things um, and I think sometimes we we try and go more to for we aim more for change, which is which this person that, that I was just talking about a moment ago, this person defined as like a a physical difference in something that you're actually doing. So you know something like um, you know I'm gonna a change would be I'm gonna hang the washing out instead of use the tumble dryer. That's, that's a really rubbish one, but you know, it's the first one that came to my head because I've got a pile of washing waiting for me at home when I get home tonight. But that that idea of change is something that's that, that's an action and we can get people to follow actions that we want them to take pretty quickly and pretty easily. But if that's the standard and we never expect them to make any kind of transition to thinking and believing in a different way, then you're never going to really integrate that person into in, into your team, are you? No, I mean, you, and I think there's a certain element of compromise in that as well. Ultimately, people yeah. aren't going to compromise on their core values and belief systems. They're not. Um, mm. and, you know, they, you, they may you know, have a slight transition uh, and be threatened on that, but ultimately their core values uh, and belief systems is, is quite set. So I think that um, it's about that coming back to that communication in terms of exploring those fundamental beliefs and values. and uh, and, and on both sides, and being able to work out transition into some kind of compromise, I think that's the only way it's going to work. But it's a really interesting point you're talking about the difference between transition and change, and uh, it's uh, it's really interesting. Good stuff. Right, we're, we're going to go to our, our final word from our friends and sponsors, and then when we come back, we've got a couple more questions to throw at Jay to uh, to wrap us up. Hi, teachers. We're apps for good and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24-7. Now you can with the teaching how-tos platform. This highly personalised social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques, either independently, working collaboratively with their peers, or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques, designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the How To app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Watch sessions by thought leaders in education, literacy experts, and ed tech specialists from the International Reading Conference for free. The lineup included renowned speakers such as TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui and beloved children's author Michael Rosen. The three-day conference explored a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Sign up to receive the recordings for free by visiting the Reading Solutions UK website 
at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Okay, welcome back. So, Jay, uh, in to sort of begin our, our wrapping up of our of our conversation tonight, then who are the unsung heroes of your team? Um, who are the unsung heroes of teams in schools in your experience, and, and what do they do that makes them so special? Uh, I would uh, I would say as a head, especially I think the the office team for the the unsung heroes, my business manager. Um, it is the, it's that heart and soul of the organisation. They just juggle so many different roles. And, yeah, I think they're definitely the engine room of the school, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, the amount of uh, the positive things they do to uh, support the school is uh, invaluable. And I don't think they're always appreciated as much uh, as they should. And I suppose I can only say that because of the fact that my, since you know the change in my role over the years, you have more interaction with them and realise what they do, especially the business manager. Yeah, without doubt, without doubt. When I was laughing at school, your uh, your receptionist came in and gave you uh, gave you an ice cream. I think so. There's, uh, yeah, exactly. there's, there's massive, massive value. <laughs> what would you say the answer to that is for you? Yeah, I, I definitely. I think the the office team. You just you. It's, it, the, the thing is with it, I think there's two bits of it. It's impossible to understand what they do until you are and, until you are like interacting with what they do on a daily basis. And then like seeing where all of their pinch points are throughout their days and how they manage those pinch points and how often they are, that they'll come in. Like sometimes I feel like I come in to, to work with a to-do list and I think like I need to try and build in like an hour at least today where – whereby there's nothing in there so that I've got room to sort of respond to stuff that comes at me throughout the day. Well, that is literally their day. It's just like Absolutely. they will have a to-do list as well, but then like the entirety of their day is just responding to people going, can I have this? Can you do this? And can we sort this out? Like how they juggle all of that is just absolutely incredible. Um, so that's the, f- the first thing with it is like, I-, I think you you can't really understand the role until you kind of have day- day-to-day interaction with it. The other thing as well is that they, they are a single point of failure. Like if, if, if they say the wrong thing or, or send out the wrong message or forget to put through, put through the invoice or whatever it might be, like the school just doesn't, that part of the school just stops. It just doesn't, doesn't run. There's no sort of picking it up later. Like it just doesn't run. Um, and so kind of to have that level of responsibility, but also be in a role within a school whereby you're you're dealing with so many different plates all at the same time is is a pretty exceptional thing to be able to do I think. Yeah, and I and I think that it's really interesting because the fact that you know obviously their job is a PR job as well as lots of other things, but you it comes back again if you're going to talk about culture. You you walk into a school and you can tell what kind of school, in my opinion, you can tell what kind of school that is straight away from the interaction you have with the office. Yeah, you can yeah. tell right away, and having, you know, it starts there. They're that first point of contact, and it sets you off in terms of, you know, your opinion of that school right at the very beginning. And they may have had three horrible emails and phone calls before they come to you, but as soon as that door comes, that smile on the face, and you know, it is crucial to be able to, you know, as a, as a PR, um, you know, to to be able to. Yeah, represent the school. It's uh, yeah, it's a very important job. I suppose the other one to, to say I think would be, um, and this is probably a bit of a controversial one, I suppose, because it's they're not always necessarily unsung, but in some cases, I think head teachers as well. Um, just because I think at the mark of, as someone said years ago to me, that the mark of a good leader is someone who takes a little bit more responsibility than what's reasonable and a little bit more blame than what's reasonable, and. Um, <laughs> I think that head teachers often 
take like a significant amount of responsibility more more responsibility than what's than what's reasonable and and almost always take a significant amount or blame than what's reasonable and often there's there's stuff that doesn't even even me as a deputy and I feel like I work pretty closely with our with, with our head teacher there'll be things that like I'm completely shielded from and I've got absolutely no no knowledge of them of them sort of happening until until kind of weeks weeks down the line I'll find out that that, that something had happened and my teacher had just sort of like taken care of it and you know and, and it could have just it could have so easily been something that that, that she could have said oh can, can you deal with that but there's a really good reason for why she's sort of taking it on and, and dealt with it and often it's to kind of protect me and shield me from stuff and she does that without any kind of um uh, without any sort of like ceremony around it it's just she just does it and um yeah, and I know well, that's important. yeah absolutely and I think that you know it's interesting that because you when you're a teacher, you're out there in front of the class. You're you're, you're doing your job. It's very open to see. So it's very different when you uh, are sitting there in that office behind the closed doors. Um, mm. But yeah, I think I'd completely agree with you, Adam. Yeah, we definitely are the unsung heroes. You um, are a hero, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> see, it was worth coming on this, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so. Um, Two things to finish with then. What's been the very best moment of your of your leadership journey so far at your school? That's really interesting. Um, I suppose for me, it comes down to seeing the growth and seeing that sense of collectiveness grow um, mm. and that sort of sense of optimism and shared vision over time really um and i suppose for me you could you have that passion don't you as a leader you have that kind of vision and it gets you really excited and you just want everyone else to just feel the same that you do have that kind of same kind of excitement and motivation as you and seeing that kind of optimism as i say and, and seeing that kind of um that buy-in um and that sort of shared vision, and uh, you know, so it, it it really makes me uh, thankful for for my job, and makes me uh, really invigorated. So, yeah, it's that kind of. It's not something which is an individual thing here and there. It's that yeah. development over time. Yeah, oh, that's I think that's that's so powerful as well. Just that. And I think it really speaks to like the reality of the job of a school leader as well, and and actually probably a, a, a teacher that the the impact that 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 your job is having is over time. It's never it's never in the moment, and I think that's easy to forget that working in schools because it does always feel like you know this is the next moment's the most important one, and it is to an extent, but the impact will be seen over time. And if you can always sort of reflect back to where you started and, and where you're trying to get to and where you're up to on that journey, then um, then yeah, I think that's a, that's a pretty important thing to be to be doing because, like you say, it's it's all about the impact you have over time. And then the last question, then I suppose, is uh, a nice one to finish on. What are the what are the next steps for you and uh, and the culture of of your school and where you, where you're going to take it next with your with your team? Yeah, so for me, it's like I want to. I'm really always trying to work on well being. I'm always trying to think about work life balance, but at the same time, not the expense of the children and trying to it's a really difficult balance isn't it it's being able to look at work-life balance and and well-being and making sure that at the same time you're you're constantly moving forward in terms of school improvement um coaching is a big thing as i know you're helping us you're the uh the expert when it comes to instructional coaching adam um well coaching. there's some inverted <laughs> commas around that that's for sure <laughs> But coaching is definitely the way forward for us. That sort of idea of personal development and being able to improve the quality of teaching and learning through rich dialogue is, is, is massively important to me. Um, and again, having teachers um, having autonomy over their own development um, is massive. Um, things like student feedback is a new step for us. So looking at um, taking away those traditional um, marking to look at um, different systems and processes which improve the quality of feedback and reduce workload at the same time. So, yeah, 
culture is critical for this. It's so important because we need to make sure that it's done collaboratively, openly over time, ensuring that buy-in and commitment and motivation from all staff. So it's not something which is we is being done to is to say it's a, it's a slow drip process whereby everyone's actively involved. So yeah, that's uh, our next step. That's, that's next week sorted then, I suppose, isn't it? It's, uh, <laughs> and it's, yeah, it's, it, it's so, you, you're so right in what you're saying that all of, with all of those things, they are, they're achievable over the long term and, and the, the culture is the thing that really underpins them. Um, and, and it's that constant paradox, I guess, of wanting the best for kids, but also wanting the best for staff, but then understanding that for the kids to get the best, the staff have got to not necessarily give more, but the staff have got to always want better for, for, for the kids as well. And how do you make, how do you encourage people to want better for the kids, but also look after them, look after themselves as well. And like, you're absolutely right. Culture and openness and that, that collective direction is, is the key to doing that because then you're going to have a situation where when people do feel overwhelmed or they need to take a step back, they can because they know that they are supported to do so. So listen, Jay, thank you so much for, for, for that tonight. It's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure and a, and a joy to, to kind of dig into to culture and team building. Thank you so much for coming on. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much for having me on, Adam. Always, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. I'm sure we'll be able to do it again sometime. Um, for everybody else that's uh, that's listening, um, do do keep uh, keep te- checking in with Teachers Talk Radio over the next few days. The next show we've got is Wednesday mornings uh, breakfast show with uh, with Sabrina. So so do uh, do check in then. Um, and other than that, I will see you and hear you hopefully next week for another show on Teachers Talk Radio, the Monday Twilight Show with me, Adam Colbeck, where we'll have a new guest and a new topic to dive into. Until then, have a lovely week. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.